There's a silent epidemic destroying families. It's called parental alienation. When a parent viciously turns their child against the other parent, over 22 million families are going through it, including ours. This is really personal to us. I'm an erased aunt. You're an erased cousin. Well, now, listen. She didn't speak to her father for nearly a decade. It was always, he's not good for you. He's selfish. He abandoned you. Now they're at the table. She sent a message that said, you're nothing to me. Don't ever reach out to me. Together. What made you give away your parental right? So Ashlyn was alienated from her father for over a decade. She says it made her hate half of who she is. Mm. Ashlyn's family was featured in the documentary called Erasing Family. Ashlyn's parents, Jennifer and Dizzy, went through a hostile divorce just months before she was born. Their relationship was so toxic, Jennifer got a restraining order and refused to let Dizzy see his children. Dizzy desperately tried to make his case for joint custody. Nothing I said mattered. None of the evidence I brought forward mattered. The judge wouldn't even look at it. My ex said plain and clearly that there was nothing that I could do to get to see my kids. As their bitter battle raged on, Dizzy felt he had no other choice but to give up. My ex-wife will go to any extreme in her vendetta against me. Therefore, I withdraw my petition and pray the situation will change in the future. And I will become a part of my daughter's lives. Ashlyn says her mother turned her against her father. I was informed that basically he was poison to me. Wow. Yeah. Ashlyn's parents have agreed to join the table, but they requested not to be in the same room. Let me just first say that I'm sorry that you've had to go through it. Because she's a liar. Still in the midst of it a bit. Thank you. As a kid, what did your mom tell you about your dad? It was always, he's not good for you. He's, yeah. he's selfish. He abandoned you. Yeah. The first thing I remember, I think I was around nine. And she said, he didn't pay the child support. And I was like, who? Just, you know, your sperm donor. I was nine, so I'm like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. It's like the first introduction to dad was, this person isn't reliable. Right. When she would say bad things about him, my first feeling was, oh my God, she's saying bad things about me. Like, right. Because it's part of me, right? Wow. So I would internalize all these things. Yeah. Kids are just internalizing this conflict. Mm. It's crazy. You start to build all these distortions in yep. your head. Yep. yep. And like your perception starts to warp, you know, oh, I'm not worthy. Yeah. So you, as a young girl, really wrapped your self-worth into... Entirely. Wow. And that believing really that your father didn't want to have anything to do with you and yeah. that he abandoned you. I totally yeah. relate to that. How else did not knowing your birth father impact your life? I started acting out. I got pretty promiscuous. Mm -hmm. I got into drugs. Right. I mean... You name it. What you're missing, you're seeking in, in others. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's how it showed up for me was this void. I remember my mom sat me down in the bedroom when I was 10. And she goes, so your father wants to reach out. And I was over the moon because I was like, oh, my God, I get to find my worth. After 10 years of being shut out of his kids' lives, Dizzy was shocked when Jennifer reached out. She said, your children want to see you. They want to be in your life. I said, how soon can you come over? God, it was such a blessing. But there were strings attached. My ex said, you know, with what they take out of your checks for child support, I know that you struggle. And um, I would like to help with that. So I have an idea. Jennifer's idea was to have her new husband, Robert, officially adopt Ashlyn and her sibling. Ashlyn's crying, I'm crying, and I've got my kid's stepdad telling me, don't worry, I'll make sure she never takes your children away from you again. Believing that promise, Dizzy signed Liar. his parental rights away in order for the adoption to go through. They both lied. When the papers were signed and the car doors were shut and everybody drove off, that was the last time I saw him. Wow. So when the whole adoption thing went through when I was 10, he was gone after that. Right. Just ripped out. And I was angry. Totally I had so right. much resentment. I had guilt for wanting to be with my dad. Mm. And 
then I had anger for having the guilt. guilt. You yeah. know, it's yeah. this like horrible cycle. A couple years went by and it was just kind of this weird epiphany moment. Like, why don't you just call him? You know, why don't you just try? But I just decided, what are you going to lose? Mm-hmm. What's the worst that's going to happen? Totally. Yeah. So I went for it. Right. That's awesome. Good for you. I feel like that takes so much courage. Mm-hmm. So Dizzy's going to come join us at the table. Come on out, Dizzy. That was hard to listen to. Yeah, I'm sure. Did you think you would ever see them after no, that? No. The last contact we had had was she sent a <laughs> message that said, you're not my dad. Yeah. You don't know who my favorite band is. You don't know what color I like. You don't know the movies I like. You're nothing to me. Don't ever reach out to me. It was a straight up, thank you very much yeah. for your DNA contribution, but you can just... Peace out. Peace out. Uh, and right. so when she was 14, she reached out. And so we talked four or five times. Mm-hmm. And then we got to do this, like Zoom, but it was before Zoom. It was some sort of video... Yeah. And um, we had our hands on the screen. Yeah, and know. she had written, she had written, "I love you" yes. on her hand, yeah. and she's sitting there like this, and she says, "Dad, no matter what, I'll see you when I'm 18." And the screen paused, and that was it. Wow. wow. Her internet got cut off. Yeah. Whoa. So I didn't hear from her again for a while, Dad. a couple of years. Yeah. Wow. And uh, that was a rough moment. I still have a screenshot on my phone. Oh, that's, that's sweet. And that was the first moment we had seen each other. Right. Since she was... Ten. Ten. Ashlyn says it was her mother and stepfather who switched off the internet in the middle of that conversation with Dizzy. I got into a vicious argument. And I ended up getting kicked out. She had called me and let me know that she was homeless. She was 14, and I have no legal right to drive up and pick her up. She's not my child, according to the courts. My stepdad and my mom came to pick me up. They told me that if I wanted to continue living in that house and have a happy family, that that meant I needed to cut ties with my real dad. Wow. You fast forward to four years later. That was when I was 18. I'm at work, and here she comes out. Bless her heart, wearing a Motley Crue shirt, one of my favorite bands. And I just kind of stood there for a minute, tears rolling down my face. I mean, ugly crying. My mascara was down to my chin. Yeah, my heart was on my chest. Like, it's just going like crazy. Yeah. It was so amazing. We're both ugly crying. Yeah. And everyone starts clapping. It was just like, I'm home. Yeah. It's just so, oh. That's awesome. And that was the one picture that got taken. Wow. 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 I'm really curious what made you sign papers to give away your parental rights. It's so permanent, so final. Yeah. 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 Feels- yeah. You're looking at your child going, guess what? I'm such a SOB that I don't care anymore. Right. Or I don't want to be there for you. Or I'm going to walk away from you. Yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah. Right. But, but I wasn't a bad dad. Yeah. yeah. Got to love your children more than you hate your ex. <laughs> that should be put on a shirt. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. Let's make shirts. Right. Bottom line. Yeah. Right. Just, honestly, I mean. That's so true. God, I'm sorry it didn't work out, but we have these life forms that we've made yeah. together. Let's, let's co-parent. Let's, let's co-parent. Right. You know? You know? I it's mean, so easy to get lost in the sauce of your own. <laughs> of your own. Oh, oh you <laughs> are telling me, girl. Yeah. I'm oh, saying. No. Beautiful that you have an opportunity now. You know, she's sitting here right yeah, next to is, you, you know? Yeah. How has it been having each other? Wiener schnitzel at 11.30. Yes. Instant freeze ice cream yes. and chili cheese dogs. Yeah, I love down, me a hot dog. Down by the river. Right. On my motorcycle on a summer's night at 11.30. Yeah. yeah. That's what it's been. Oh, that is That's so what it's been. That's fantastic. Memories. Yeah. Finding oh. things together <laughs> that make us who we are. She's an extraordinary person. Yeah. How did it feel to just hear your father say to you that you are an extraordinary person? Oh. Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Oh, you big sap. <laughs> <laughs> I 
still love you. Yeah, oh, man. yeah. After reconnecting with her father, Ashlyn cut off almost all contact with her mother for eight years. I can talk to her right now. I don't even know what I would say. I'd just be so happy that she's talking to me. Just over 18 months ago, Ashlyn and her mother reconnected. My goodness, how many people are going through this epidemic? Unfortunately, I have so many friends that are going through this exact situation right now, and it's really bad. Melissa has not had a relationship with her three children in three years after a difficult divorce. First of all, let me just say, I am so sorry that you were going through this. Thank you. I cannot imagine not seeing my children for three years. Yeah. Alyssa sat down with Dr. Amy Baker, author of Surviving Parental Alienation and one of the world's leading experts on this epidemic. Dr. Amy counsels alienated parents on how to communicate with their children. Hey, Alyssa. Hi. Tell me a little bit about your kids and sort of what happened. I have three children. They're 14, 16, and 18 currently. I was married for 17 years. At the end of my marriage, things got um, very tumultuous. There were some events that took place that were pretty traumatic um, where I was removed from my home immediately. There was a restraining order with my ex-husband and so I was not able to oh, restraining order. That sounds familiar. Be anywhere near him or be anywhere near my home. And through that process I lost my relationship with my children. Yep. And I'm trying desperately to work on how to reunite with them. I think the hardest thing for a targeted parent to hear is I don't want to talk to you. Sometimes I feel like I can hear my ex-husband, his voice in them. And, and that's really hard for me. Oh yeah, it is helpful to remember that it is coming from the other parent. The kids are the messenger, but the message is coming from the other parent. The natural thing to do if you're accused of something that's false is to say, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous, I didn't do that. But all of those things are unhelpful because if you tell a child that's not true, you're basically calling your child a liar. But you don't have to apologize and you don't have to argue there is something else to do. It's called the five steps. Step one, you thank your child. You should feel grateful because if your child's bringing a complaint to you, it means they care enough to share that feeling with you. Because the alternative is your child complains about you to the other parent. The second step is to be compassionate. Pay attention to what your child is feeling and you reflect it back. Like I can see how mad you are thinking that I, whatever it is. You so can't do that when they block empathy. you. It's where you put yourself in his shoes. If I believed what you believed, You can't do that when they block you. And then you get <laughs> right, to step kids? four where you get to say your truth. Most of the time the accusation is subjective. You don't listen to me, you don't love me, you're mean to daddy. To your fault the marriage ended. And then you say, I see that differently, very calmly. And then you end step five with a recap, more gratitude, compassion, and empathy. So you would say, I understand that you think X happened and that's why you're so upset. And I'm so grateful you're telling me because now I know where you're coming from. And if you can do those five steps, parents tell me it works. You because can't your when your kids block you. Cared about. You know wow. what stuck out in that for me, Alyssa, when you said that sometimes when they're sharing with you what they're feeling, what you hear is your husband's oh, voice. Yes. And, his and that was so and real. Feelings. It's so hard. I have a friend that's going through the exact same thing that you're going Sorry. through right now. Sometimes that person will read text back and say to me, this is my partner. This is not mm -hmm. even my freaking kids. Right. Having kids feel like they can disrespect the other parent yeah. mm -hmm. is really hard. I've seen kids literally curse their parents out. Unfortunately, it's crazy. Yep. what would seem like the right thing to do turns out often not to be helpful. The idea that if a child disrespects you, you should say, how dare you be nasty, rude, disrespectful right. to me. That actually does not work. So there's a lot really? of this because if your child's being disrespectful, certainly in alienation cases, the child's coming from a place of anger and hurt. Mm -hmm. And if you start by reacting to their bad behavior, 
You're just saying, I don't really care where you're coming from. I just don't want you to be rude to me. Exactly. Yeah. I encourage my clients to start by saying, wow, you must be really upset with me. Yeah. yeah. And then you describe what they're doing in non-shaming, non-blaming ways. Rather than saying you're being rude, you're being nasty, you say Mine you're talking listen in to a that. way that doesn't feel good for me. Or I don't want to be cursed at. Or you're talking very loud and it's hurting my ears. And then you invite the child to tell you what's going on without right. that behavior. Right. Tell me yeah. what's going on in a way that can work for me. Yeah. And you're role modeling to them, yeah. hopefully one day, mm -hmm. how to stand up to the alienator. Got exactly. it. Yeah. Alyssa, what do you love about being a mom? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I had my kids when I was 24, and so they were my everything. It's the little things, make them their breakfast or have that hug. Being able to see the world through them and to experience it with them is everything. Yeah. And so when that is taken away, you feel empty. Sometimes I define alienation as where one parent gives the child permission to break the other parent's heart. Yeah. Wow. Yes, that's exactly it. That protection order with my husband restricted me from being around my children because they were still living in the home. If he yep. would be where they were, I couldn't be at those events. Dr. Mm -hmm. Amy, does this yep. happen regularly? It happens to dads, it happens too. so often that I tell my clients, pack a bag, have it ready, have cash. I'm not saying drain the bank accounts. That's not proper. But have some money set aside. Have a plan and be prepared that it could happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's very easy to get a temporary restraining order. Anybody yep. can right, show up Julie? in court and claim to be a victim. Now, many people actually are. Right. I'm certainly not saying everybody who asks for a restraining Same order is right. faking it, but when somebody does, it's very hard for the system to detect. 80% like, of the time, they are claim. faking it the and lying. The system is designed to err on the side of caution to protect right, Julie? people. What that means is pretty much anybody can get a temporary restraining order. The person who is the accused uh, perpetrator is not notified. It's called an ex parte motion. You go to, to the judge without the other person even knowing. They don't mm -hmm. have an opportunity to say their side of things. Yep. Then in three days, there's a hearing. At that point, the accused person is notified and they do show up, hopefully. However, They're not and this is so important for people to understand, attorneys often tell the person, Oh, just sign it. Make this, the, you know, it's not a big deal. No problem. Don't fight it. You'll lose anyway. A lot of attorneys aren't really prepared to take that three-day hearing and treat it like the most important thing in somebody's uh, life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is everybody assumes, well, they wouldn't have signed it if they weren't really guilty. So there's this stain, you know, this cloud that hangs over people. The kids think, well, mom wouldn't have signed it. The judge wouldn't have said this is a, a restraining mm -hmm. order if mom wasn't really guilty. And this happens yep. all the time is even if the kids aren't on the restraining order, in other words, it's just between the two parties, if the person who supposedly needs to be protected is always with, with the, the kids, kids. Yeah. Yes. and the other parent isn't allowed to be with the kids. So it's effectively interrupting yep. the ability to have contact with their yeah. children. Bingo. Right. I'm really hoping and praying yeah. that this gets resolved mm -hmm. for you and for your children. I feel like every child needs their mom. Yes. And their dad. So I'm really hoping that yep. that happens for you. Thank you so much, Thank you guys. Alyssa and Dr. Amy. <laughs> <laughs>